Hey guys, welcome back to Six Science Facts with Miss Jamie. I'm so happy you decided to come back and watch another one with us today. Um, without much ado, I guess we'll just dive right in. Um, so for the first topic, birds and leaves, we are learning about the cuckoo today. The cuckoo, it's a nice illustration. It says, many species of cuckoo practice brood parasitism tricking another bird into raising its young by laying its eggs in a stranger's nest. The cuckoo gets its name from the call of the common cuckoo, often heard in cuckoo clocks. Okay, yeah, I've definitely heard cuckoo clocks before, and but I did not know that other, that, that cuckoos lay their eggs in other birds' nests so they don't have to raise their babies. <laughs> That's pretty funny. All right, so the second topic is flowers and bugs. And today we are learning about something that I know you guys have seen plenty of times, see all the time, dandelions. Beautiful. A bright yellow flower that delights children and frustrates lawn owners, the dandelion is a nutritious, full of vitamins and minerals, and beautiful weed. The familiar yellow flower is found from May to July. It eventually closes and when it reopens the yellow petals are replaced by a white spherical seed head ready to be blown by wind or children. Dandelions also provide nectar and pollen for bees. Wow, so you know, I had heard lots of times that in the past people used to drink like dandelion tea because it was really good for you, but I didn't know that that was a scientific fact. But it is apparently. According to this card, um, dandelions are full of vitamins and minerals, which means they're really healthy for you. So, in a pinch, you can eat dandelions. I also didn't know, um, not officially at least, that the white blowing flowers are the same as dandelions. They, Their flowers go away and then the white heads come up and then you can blow them, which is obviously one way that dandelions spread. Topic number three, fossils and minerals. Today we're learning about the feathered dinosaur. Look at that. Feathered dinosaur. That's interesting. In the 1900s, Fossils of theropods, relatives of the T-Rex, were discovered in China. Their skin was covered with feathery filaments, supporting the already popular theory that birds are descendants of dinosaurs. These feathers may have initially developed to conserve heat, not for flight. They may have also been used for, to, for display to attract a mate. Okay, that's interesting. So I don't know if you guys have heard this theory before, but yeah, lots of scientists think that birds are descended from dinosaurs. And there's another theory that the chicken is the closest living relative that we have to the T-Rex. Um, obviously that's not what this says, and we don't know if that's true, but that is a theory that I heard. Um, but this, this is absolutely true. These are facts. So, it's interesting that feathers were originally sort of developed in evolution to conserve heat. Um, or that's what they think. Similar to the way we have hair on our bodies to conserve heat for us. So that's pretty interesting. So the next topic for facts is under the water. And today we're going to learn about, super interesting, the deepest place in the ocean. The Mariana Trench in the Western Pacific Ocean between Japan and New Guinea is the deepest known part of the ocean. Over six and a half miles deep, the weight of this deep water is 16,000 pounds, which is eight tons per square inch. That's the weight of eight automobiles balanced on top of a single postage stamp. I know that's really hard to imagine, but 
Um, the deal with when you get really far under the ocean is that all the water sitting on top of you creates pressure on your body. So um, when you get down that far deep into the ocean, all of that water is so heavy that it's like on a single postage stamp, the amount of weight is like eight cars. Um, gosh, that's, that's so crazy. Um, I don't even think we've been to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. I think that they still are going to explore it, possibly soon. So I wonder what's down there. Probably different forms of life, probably some, maybe some chemicals that we don't even know about. Like, who knows? There's still so much to discover in the world. Only two more facts to learn about this week. The first one is going to be about mammals. And it's about one of my personal favorite mammals, which is ba -ba -ba, dolphin. Dolphins are so interesting to me, and they've always been super interesting to me, even when I was little. I was actually, fun fact about me, I was so obsessed with dolphins when I was little that for my 13th birthday, my parents bought me a session to go swimming with dolphins. Um, and it was amazing. It was so much fun. They're so huge. They're like as big as horses. They're like bigger than horses. And it's really intimidating to be around one when you're in the water and it's in the water. You're out of your element. It was really cool. But anyway, back to the fact. Ba -ba -ba. Dolphins. An aquatic mammal. The dolphin is highly intelligent and, like the bat, uses echolocation to find its prey, which is fid, squish, or crustaceans. By emitting a high-pitched sound that bounces back from objects and instantly interpreting the echo, the dolphin can recognize objects with great accuracy. Wow. It's so amazing how different animals have learned to sense the world. Um, I don't know if you know about echolocation already, but it's basically where an animal makes a sound and when the, when the sound happens, when eh, that sound goes out into the room and bounces off all the different objects that exist in the room and that echo bounces back to the, to the individual that made the sound. And for animals that use echolocution, their brains automatically interpret where the objects are physically in the room as if you're seeing them with your eyes. It's so amazing. So that's how dolphins find their prey. That's also how bats find their prey. So it's interesting that you can use echolocution in the air and also in the water. It doesn't matter. Um, that doesn't have an effect on it. So. Dolphins are really smart. They they communicate with each other. They play. Um, they're one of the smartest mammals in the world. I think they're second smartest to humans. So that's super cool and interesting. All right, we're down to our last one, which is weather and celestial. And today we are going to be learning about the tornado. Yeah. We get a lot of these in Illinois. Um, every season is torn. Well, not every spring is tornado season, and sometimes we even get them in the summer. So, yeah. All right. This says a tornado is a column of air that rotates with great speed while making contact with the ground below and with a cloud above. The spinning of a tornado can be violent and cause great damage as objects on the ground are pulled into the funnel of air. Winds of a powerful tornado of a powerful tornado can reach 300 miles per hour. Wow, that is really fast. When you're driving in your car with your parents, you're probably going 40 miles per hour. And tornadoes can go 300 miles per hour. Yeah, when I was little, I used to get super scared of tornadoes. I've never actually gone through one or experienced one, but whenever I would hear the sirens, I would just like panic. And now I know that panicking will never help you in any situation. It will only make the situation worse. So I try to stay calm, but yeah, they used to really freak me out when I was little. All 
Alright, so now that we've learned our six new facts for the week, we're on to the final segment of six science facts, which we did not have last week because it was the first week. So the final segment is when we take one of the facts that we learned from the previous week and we read a book about it that we have at the library here. So um, I decided to use polar bears because there were no comments. If there are comments telling me which fact to, to learn about, I will obey those comments. But I chose since nobody requested anything. Um, just as a refresher, actually, I'll read you the fact again. It says, native to the Arctic, the polar bear is the largest bear and the largest living land carnivore. Beneath its white fur, its skin is as black as its nose. This helps the body absorb heat from the sun. Further protection from the cold is offered by a thick layer of blubber beneath the skin. The polar bear is endangered by climate change as much of the ice habitat upon which it depends is melting. <sighs> I decided to do polar bears because I think talking about climate change is really important because we only have one earth and all the creatures on it including us depend on their unique ecosystems for survival and the arctic is one of the ecosystems that is most endangered by us. Um, so I found this book. It's called Waiting for Ice. And we're going to read about it. Before we get started with the actual book, I want to tell you a little bit about it. It says the book is based on the true story of a polar bear named Tuff. Researcher Dr. Nikita, who has spent 17 years studying polar bears, first reported seeing this orphan cub in October of 2002. The doctor didn't think that she would survive because her mother was gone and she was an orphan, but she did and so she named her Tough. Alright, let's get started. A polar bear cub, barely 10 months old, leaps out of the waves onto the gravel beach. She shakes the sea off and looks around. There are lots of other polar bears on this bit of land, but she doesn't see her mother. Screaming, the young cub searches in one direction, then another. She sees a lot of adult females, but none is her mother. The cub runs away, screaming even louder. Whether orphaned or lost, the cub is among strangers, most much bigger than she is. The cub has lost her mother. I wonder if we're going to find out why. Babies need their moms no matter if you're human or polar bear. It's early October. The polar bears have spent the summer on Wrangell Island, far north of Russia in the Arctic Ocean, trapped because the drifting pack of ice that they roam has melted. They must wait for the patchwork quilt of ice to return so they can hunt for seals and whales from these floating life rafts. But this summer has been warmer than usual. The polar bears crowd together on a spit of land, stretching out into the sea and wait for the ice that is late in coming. The young cub roams among them, searching for her mother. When another female with a cub blocks her way and growls, the young cub bolts from the spit, heading inland. She runs over rock-studded, ice-crusted tundra up a steep slope. This past December, on another hillside, she was born in a snow den. Her mother kept her close, safe, and well-fed, even after she climbed out of the den in early April. Polar bear cubs usually stay with their mothers two to three years. But this cub is already alone, on her own. Uh. 
slowing to a walk, the cub crosses a ridge. She stops from time to time to lift her head and sniff. Nearby are jagged cliffs where all summer thousands of black-legged kittywalks nested, raising chicks. The flock has flown south, but the cub follows her keen nose and finds a dead bird. She feeds on this and then walks on, carrying what's left for later. Aw, she's trying to survive on her own. She doesn't know how to hunt because she's just a baby, so she has to forage for food. Forage means to just find something that's been left by somebody else. After a while, the cub curls up and naps with her back to the wind. Some signal alerts her, a scent or a sound, and she opens her eyes to an arctic fox sneaking up close. She chases the prey, but with bushy tail flying, the fox sprints away, and by the time the cub returns, the fox has circled back and stolen what was left of the bird. Several days later, hunger drives the cub back to the beach. Now even more polar bears wait on the spit. There's ice offshore, but it's the size of giant lily pads and pancake thin, too weak to support polar bears. With the migrating prey gone, the hunters are hungry. They chew on old whale bones and fight for the few fish that do wash ashore. Because the ice isn't forming the way it used to, see how it's disrupting their ecosystem? They can't go hunt like they used to, so food isn't available to them. They're starving. Day after day for nearly two weeks, the cub grabs a mouthful of food wherever she can. Most young orphan cubs die of hunger or become prey themselves. Though she grows thin, this young female stays alive. The cub is napping on a rise when the walruses arrive to rest on the beach. She awakes to loud barks and the sight of boulder-sized bodies resting so close together that each leans its long tusks on its neighbor. Hungry polar bears patrol the walrus herd on the lookout for the weak of the, or the wounded. Suddenly, one big male polar bear charges in. Pushing, grunting walruses stampede into the sea. A calf lags behind. The big male bites the calf's neck and pulls it away. The mother walrus turns with tusks raised to strike, but the male is already hauling the calf up the rise. The hungry cub leaps up and trails after him. When she catches up, the big male stands with blood-stained face between her and his meal. She circles and then belly crawls closer while he feeds. When she finally takes a bite of the walrus flesh, the big male growls but lets her stay. While the cub eats her fill, the snow begins. By the time the male plods away, the air is full of swirling flakes. The cub finds shelter nearby among rocks and curls up to wait out the storm, roaring ashore from the sea. For nearly a week, the blizzard rages while the cub lives on leftovers and sleeps. When it stops, the whole world is changed. Pregnant female polar bears head for the mountains to den in drifts where they'll sleep, give birth, and keep their cubs safe until spring comes again. Along the shore is the biggest change of all. 
the pack ice is back. The waiting is over. Free to roam and hunt, big adult females leave at once. Over the next few days, young adults follow. So do mothers with cubs trailing behind them. The orphan cub lingers on this land that is harsh, hungry, and home. Daily, though, she goes out onto the ice to explore. One day, she stops to nap. While she sleeps, the ice cracks. When she awakes, she's adrift. Though Wrangell Island is only a short swim away, she stays. To grow up, she'll have to learn to hunt on the Arctic Ocean using ice floes as resting places. And that is exactly what she will do. With a leap to another flow, she heads out onto the ice. Wow. So the scientists were following that cub for many years and, and tracking her. So that's why they were able to write this book about what really happened to her. There are some fun facts at the Alright. There's one part at the end that I want to read because it's about climate change and Climate change is kind of the reason that I decided to read this book about polar bears um, and focus on that fact. It says, Global Warming. The gradual warming of the Earth's climate is one of the biggest threats to polar bears. While searching for their prey, these predators may swim 60 miles without stopping. But they can't swim indefinitely. They need to rest on ice floes in the sea. By mid-July, during the Arctic summer, much of the ocean's ice covering melts or breaks up and drifts far north, forcing polar bears ashore. Many take refuge on Wrangell Island, north of Russia, near their summer hunting grounds. Wrangell Island is far away from other islands and the mainland, so the bears remain trapped there, waiting for ice to surround the island again. Normally, that happens in late September, but temperature increases from global climate change mean that the sea now frequently remains free from pack ice for many more weeks, sometimes until late November. Because the island's food supply is primarily migrating birds and walruses, competition for food becomes intense. So we can see how climate change is affecting these polar bears. The way that they hunt is being disrupted, and so they are starving. Um, learn more about climate change. Um, read about books and ask your teachers, and look on good websites that have um, factual scientific information, um, because it's something that affects all of us and it affects the animals, and it affects the ecosystems that we live in. So it's important that we all do our part to minimize climate change. Well, human-induced climate change, because the climate will change on its own. But we can't ignore the fact that humans and the way that we live our lives also impacts the climate. So it's important to live your life in a way that minimizes the amount the amount that you affect the environment. So that's important to think about every day. Like for instance, I grow some vegetables at home and I also have a compost bin. The compost bin minimizes the amount of food that I send out and to go into dumps and, and waste, like waste yards and stuff like that. And the vegetables that I grow um, means that I don't support big agricultural companies that ruin land and take advantage of people and um, all that type of stuff. So it's important that you think about the way you live your life and try to min minimize the damage that you do on the environment. 
Alright guys, this has been Six Science Facts. Comment below if you want me to read a particular book about a fact next week. If not, I will choose again. Um, have a great day, okay? Stay safe out there. Bye, guys.